A reading from Inside the Yoga Sutras by Reverend Jagannath Carrera. References Sutra number 1.30. Disease, dullness, doubt, carelessness, laziness, sensuality, false perception, failure to reach firm ground, and slipping from the ground gained. These distractions of the mind stuff are the obstacles. The list of obstacles will be familiar to those who have been practicing yoga for any length of time. Every seeker faces them at various points of their spiritual journey. Vikshepa, translated as distraction, means false projection, scattering, dispersing, and shaking of the mind stuff. Vikshepa suggests that the obstacles are synonyms of a lack or loss of focus. It is interesting to note that misperception is also born of lack of steady mental focus. Again and again, we see why Narodaha, the ability to attain a clear, focused mind, is the cornerstone of spiritual life. The obstacles form a kind of chain reaction, one leading into the next. Disease. This stands for dis-ease. Any physical discomfort or disorder that prevents us from fully engaging in yoga practices. It can present as any number of diverse problems, such as fatigue, aching lower back when we're sitting for meditation, nagging allergies, or frequent headaches. Whatever the reason, the student's practice becomes irregular due to the challenge of physical distress. Dullness. What is the result of an irregular practice? Not much progress is made. It's hard to be keen and intent if you don't experience anything nice in your practices. The mind begins to have a hard time focusing. Nurodaha begins to seem like an impossible dream. The end result is dullness of mind. When the mind can't focus, it can't penetrate into the deeper meaning of things. This being so, the next stage naturally follows. Doubt. I don't know, these teachings are awfully intense and they seem too idealistic. Or maybe I don't have a talent for this. I'm also starting to wonder if maybe my teacher doesn't know what's really best for me. We doubt the veracity or practicality of the teachings, or even more troublesome, we doubt ourselves. We have not made the progress we thought we would. We feel a bit let down. Our hearts are not in our practice like before. Our regular practice now includes a new factor, uncertainty. Doubt can be a serious impediment to progress. When our practice has stalled due to doubt, our first duty is to have the doubts cleared. Ask questions of adepts and masters. Read and study more. Do whatever it takes to remove the uncertainties from your heart. Of course, doubt, in addition to being its own difficult obstacle, adds fuel to dullness carelessness. Even though the first three obstacles are working their spell, being a good student, you persevere. But there's not much enthusiasm. Your practices become mechanical and lack conviction and intensity. To the keen and intent practitioner, this samadhi comes very quickly. The time necessary for success also depends on whether the practice is mild, moderate, or intense. That relates to sutras 1.21 and 1.22. The energy of the mind is torn by doubt and dissipated by disease and dullness. It is natural that such a practice be marked by carelessness. You barely pay attention to your practices. Do I just inhale and hold my breath? What round am I doing? The end of your meditation session comes and you have no idea what you've been doing for the past 30 minutes probably not repeating your mantra. 
Not only do you cease experiencing progress, but whatever momentum and depth your practice had are slipping away. Laziness. Yoga practice now becomes nothing more than a chore. Do you feel like practicing anymore? Not likely. You become lazy with regard to your practices. Lord Buddha taught that the only sin was laziness. If we do not even attempt to better ourselves, how can there be hope for success in yoga? Sensuality. The mind is bored, and a bored mind always looks for a distraction, a new amusement, or something to do. It gets mischievous. If it cannot find anything satisfying within the practices, it will look to gratify the senses. The Sanskrit word for sensuality, avarati, also means to dissipate and refers to the dissipation of our energy that comes when the mind loses its focus and resolves and seeks to satisfy sensual cravings. The decrease in the energy exacerbates all the other obstacles. False perception. Yes, I used to practice Raja Yoga. Don't get me wrong, some aspects of yoga are good. But these Eastern philosophies miss the point. After all, shouldn't I live with gusto, wringing out every drop of fun I can? And those yogis lived so long ago, Patanjali could not have anticipated today's world. Or maybe he just didn't face life as it is. It seems that yoga is really about the suppression of natural impulses and emotions. I wonder how different these sutras would be if Patanjali were alive today. What seemed so clearly true in the beginning now seems out of touch. We may begin to believe that our assessment of yoga as meaningful for our lives was a mistake. Most practices are abandoned with the exception of perhaps a few stress-relieving techniques. False perception is noteworthy among the obstacles because it most resembles ignorance. Failure to reach firm ground. It is difficult to make progress when the practices and attainments have not become firmly grounded, an integral part of how we experience life. Another way to understand this obstacle is that it is the inability to attain or maintain focused attention. Slipping from ground gained. Slipping from the ground gained can happen because we fall back into harmful habits. And due to extended periods of physical or emotional stress, or even because after making a little progress, we get a little complacent and rest on our laurels. Whatever the reason, it is a common experience to lose, at least temporarily, some of the spiritual progress we made. It is very discouraging to work hard, make some progress, and then slip back. It can feel like Dante's vision of hell, where poor souls expend tremendous energy to crawl out of an immense burning pit, only to fall back into the flames at the brink of escape. If these obstacles are left unchecked, we will lose much of what we have gained. The guarantee of never falling back arrives only with the highest samadhi. Yet for those of us who have done our share of slipping, it is reassuring that Sri Patanjali understands our plight. He knows that this happens and has given us two powerful remedies. Sutra 1.29, regarding the way to overcome obstacles, and Sutra 1.32, which explains the best method to prevent obstacles. It's easy to become discouraged when we experience these obstacles. We should remind ourselves that encountering obstacles is natural. Instead of becoming discouraged or worried, we can take the opportunity to look within and see what lessons the obstacles can teach us. There is a story that demonstrates the sneaky way obstacles can slip into our lives and distract us from our intentions. Not all the obstacles are represented in this tale, but you will recognize a few of the key ones and the slippery slope they present. 
There once was a young yogi who had lived at his guru's ashram for a number of years. He was a dedicated disciple who practiced with great fervor. One day he noticed the master looking at him in a curious way. Master, is there something wrong? You are looking at me in the most peculiar way. No, nothing is wrong. But as I was watching you, it occurred to me. It would be good for you to experience a period of seclusion to focus on deepening your meditation. Fine, Master, I'm happy to do as you say. Good. A few miles from here, there is a nice forest with a small village nearby where you can go and beg for your daily food. Stay there until I come for you. It sounds perfect. I'll go at once. Following his master's instructions, he took only a begging bowl and two loin cloths. Arriving at the bank of a stream, he found an elevated spot where he built his hut. He then began a routine that was repeated faithfully for many weeks. After morning meditation, he would take one loin cloth, wash it, drape it on the roof of his hut to dry, then walk to the village to beg for food. Then one day, when he came back to the hut, he noticed that a rat had eaten a hole in his loincloth. What to do? The next day he begged for food and another loincloth. The villagers were only too happy to help him. Unfortunately, the rat would not go away and continued ruining one loincloth after another. One villager took pity on him. Son, look how much trouble that rat is causing you. Every day you have to beg for food and also for a new loincloth. What you need is a cat to keep away the rat. The young man was stunned at the simple logic of the answer. That very day he begged for food, a loincloth, and a cat. He obtained a nice kitten. But things did not go as anticipated. Although the cat did keep away the rat, it too needed food. Now he had to beg for a bowl of milk for his cat, as well as food for himself. This went on for several weeks until... Young man, I noticed that you're begging for food for yourself and milk for your cat. Why don't you get a cow? Not only can you feed the cat, you'll even have milk left over for yourself. He thought this was brilliant. Took a little time, but he was able to find a villager to give him a cow. By now, you may have guessed what happens next. While the milk from the cow fed the cat and provided some milk for him, it also needed to eat. Now when he begged for food, he also had to ask for hay for the cow. After some time, dear boy, what a burden it is to beg for food and hay for your cow, too. Just do one simple thing and all your problems will be over. You were living on a very fertile soil. Beg for hay seed and plant hay to feed the cow. You will certainly have enough hay left over to sell in the town. With the extra money, you could buy whatever you need. The young disciple wondered how he could have missed such a simple solution. He found hay seed to sow and soon harvested a rich crop of hay. But one day, a villager spotted him, looking haggard. Son! You are working too hard. You have a growing business to look after. What you need is a wife to share responsibilities with you. Later on, your children will also be able to help. Of course, he thought. It's so simple. He did find a nice woman to marry. His business and family grew by leaps and bounds. In fact, his hut was soon replaced by a mansion staffed with servants. One day, there was a knock at the door. The young man walked to the door and looked into the eyes of his master. A sudden rush of recognition brought back memories of long-forgotten and neglected commitments. Looking heavenward, he raised his arms high and shouted, All for want of a loincloth! The moral of the story is not don't have pets or a business or a spouse. It's always keep your eye on your goal. It is too easy to slip from the ground gained. Om Shanti.